money. We want more. We need more. We never run out of ways to spend money. We dream of money. We work for money. We budget money. We invest money in hope that it will grow. Money, it buys us our cars and our houses. It puts food on our tables, clothes on our back. Money, it provides for our present. It holds promise for our future. Which raises the question, how important should money be for you and for me? How passionately should we desire money? How vigorously should we pursue money? What role should money play in the choices we make? What place should money hold in your life as a Christian? What place should it hold in mine? Money. It's a fact of life in this world. So how in the world should we spend our money? Should we view our money? How should we use our money as a follower of Jesus Christ? That's a question that's critically important to our lives as Christians. And fortunately, Jesus does not leave us to ourselves to figure out the answer. If you have your Bible, turn with me today to Luke chapter 12. Luke 12, verses 13 through 21. In Luke chapter 12, beginning with verse 13, 13 through 21, Jesus does remind us that while money is a necessity in this life, anyone who puts their ultimate hope in money will lose their soul. Beginning with Luke 12, verse 13, we find Jesus teaching. And we read, Someone in the crowd said to him, said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool! This night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. In Jesus' day, the Israelites commonly would look to respected rabbis to settle their differences and their disputes. After all, a good rabbi knew God and he knew the word of God. Who better to go to when a disagreement arose? And so it really came as no surprise when a man in the crowd cries out to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But notice that Jesus wants no part in this man's financial dispute. It's as if Jesus says, I didn't come to judge between two men. I came to judge between men and God. I didn't come to arbitrate between you and your brother. I came to arbitrate between you and your maker. In other words, Jesus says, I did not come to deal with things that are perishable. 
I came to deal with eternal things, things that never end. And so, it's eternal things that Jesus has in mind when he warns you and me, take care, take care. Be on your guard against all covetousness. What does covetousness mean? Well, coveting means hungering for what God chooses not to give you rather than being content and grateful for what he has given you. Covetous, covetousness means never being satisfied with what you have. It always means wanting a little bit more, maybe a lot more, more money, more comfort, more possessions. But why? Why in this material world does Jesus warn us to be on guard against all greed and all covetousness? When verse 15, Jesus tells us to guard against all greed and covetousness because, he says, one's life, your life, my life, it does not consist in the abundance of our possessions. Now please stop and listen to that one more time. Jesus says, he warns us, take care, be on guard against all covetousness, against all greed, because one's life does not consist in the abundance of one's possessions. Are you kidding me? One's life does not consist in the abundance of his or her possessions? Really? Does anyone in America believe that? Do any of us in this church believe it? And if we say we believe it, would an impartial observer watching us, maybe studying our checkbook, would that impartial observer find evidence of our belief that our lives do not consist, consist of the things we possess? The parable Jesus tells in verses 16 through 21 helps us understand, helps us evaluate really what our attitude towards possessions and money might really be. Let me read that parable one more time. Verses 16 through 21, Luke writes, And he, Jesus, he told them, the crowd, he tells us, he tells you and me, he tells us a parable. The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns. I will build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul. You have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God, but God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And all the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So Jesus says, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. In Jesus' story, we meet a man who builds his life on the principle that life actually does consist of our possessions, the abundance of one's possessions. Or as we might say it today, and you see it on bumper stickers, the one who dies with the most toys wins. So let's call this man in this story, material man. Material man. More than that, let's consider, if we dare, let's consider how much material man just might be like you and like me. 
Do we think like material man? Do we live like material man? Do we honestly spend our money like material man or hoard our money, our possessions, like material man? You know, those are questions we need to honestly consider today, and especially if we call ourselves Christians. So what are the marks of a material man? What are the marks of a material woman? How could we know if, in fact, we are rich toward God? Or if perhaps all the wealth we possess, we possess only for this life. How do we know that God will not call us fool on the day we stand before him? Well, the first mark of a material man, the first mark of a material woman is the lack of appreciation towards God as provider. A lack of appreciation towards God as provider. I don't know if you noticed in this story, but in the course of only three verses, the rich man uses the words I and my 11 times in three verses. In verse 17, the rich man asks, what shall I do with no reference to God? Everything the rich man has, he regards as belonging to himself and himself alone. The man speaks of my crops, my barns, my grain, my goods, and even my soul. This man is a proud man. This man is a self-made man. This man is a self-sufficient man. Everything he has, he earns. What need is there for him to acknowledge God? But were those abundant crops really his crops? Did this man really produce his own prosperity? Was he himself the ultimate source of his wealth? Notice what Jesus says in verse 16. Jesus did not say, a rich man produced plentifully. Jesus says, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. You hear that? It wasn't the rich man who produced plentifully. It was the land and make no mistake about it, when the land produced plentifully, it produced plentifully only by the grace and by the goodness of God himself. God provided it. Everything the rich man had, he has because of God. And it's to God the rich man should have offered his gratitude, his thanksgiving. It's to God this rich man should have offered his praise. Do we know the same is true for you and me? You know, do we understand that everything we have ultimately comes to us from the hand of God? But you say, I worked hard to get to where I'm at today. I was diligent. I overcame obstacles. I worked my way through school. On we could go. But then we have to step back and ask the questions. Who gave you your health that allowed you to do any of those things? Who gave you your drive, your ambition, if you will? Who really opened doors of opportunity for you? Opportunities to advance. Who created you with the gifts you possess, the abilities you possess, the talents you have. Who's the one who caused your work to bear fruit? Don't we know that without God, we really have nothing? Without God, we produce nothing. Without God, we are nothing. And the moment we forget that, is the moment we become a material man, a material woman. 
But that's not all. Not only do material men lack appreciation towards God as provider, material people also, and it follows logically, they lack generosity. Material people lack generosity. Follow this rich man's train of thought. Once he recognized that his wealth exceeded his present needs, he says, what shall I do? He asks, I have nowhere, he says, to store my crops. Then he says, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns, my little barns, and I'll build bigger barns. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. What's missing there? Well, what's missing is any thought that God might be blessing him so that he in turn could bless others. What's missing is the recognition that he was not the owner of his possessions, but he was rather a steward of God's possessions entrusted to him. What's missing is the recognition that as God's steward, he would one day be called to give an account for how he spent God's money and how he used God's possessions. And that's why instead of investing the wealth at his disposal in things that are eternal, he hoarded that wealth for himself for use on this earth because, in fact, he trusted in that wealth rather than trusting in God. And so again, I wonder how different we really are. As Americans, generally speaking, we are a wealthy people. So how much of our wealth do we share? How much do we give? How much, on the other hand, do we hoard and save up for ourselves? How often do we hope and trust in our money and make our money our security instead of hoping and trusting in God as our security? Now, as Christians... We need to remember that stinginess and greed are not secondary issues. Generosity or lack of generosity expresses whether we do or don't have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. You don't believe that? Listen to 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 and 10. That's where Paul writes, do you not know, professing Christians, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Paul says, do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves. Preach it, Paul. Uh-oh. Nor the greedy nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Same way, Colossians 3.5 commands us, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Put to death sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and what? And covetousness, which is is idolatry. How come we're so quick to condemn sexual immorality? So quick to condemn homosexual practice, to condemn adultery, to condemn theft and drunkenness, while at the same time we so seldom mention covetousness and greed and stinginess. You know, since God does not leave greed off his sin list, 
maybe we ought not leave it off our sin list either, even if it does tend to hit pretty close to home far too often. Eternal destinies are at stake here. Maybe our eternal destinies are at stake here. No wonder Jesus warns us to be on guard, to be on guard against all covetousness. We need to examine ourselves. We need to know whether we really believe Jesus when he says that life does not consist in the abundance of our possessions. Do we think like that? Do we live like that? Or are we material men? Are we material women? Material people live with little appreciation for God as their provider. Material people are hoarders who lack generosity. After all, if you really believe you got it by yourself, then why not keep it for yourself? But there's something else we learn from Jesus' parable about material people. The material man, the material woman, lacks eternal perspective. Lacks eternal perspective. Let's read Luke 12, 18 and 19 one more time. Seeing that he had more wealth than he could presently use or even presently store, the rich man said to himself, I'll do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. What's that sound like to you? It's the American dream. I mean, it really is. This sounds like really solid retirement planning. It does. You ever notice how many financial planner ads there are on TV? E.F. Hutton, Raymond James, Edward Jones, Fidelity, Vanguard, on I could go. And isn't the basic message always the same? Plan for your future by investing your money with us and we'll make your retirement years the best years of your life. Now, lest I be misunderstood, let me say there's nothing wrong with doing some planning for retirement. Unless, of course, you want to spend your last days living in your kid's basement. And you probably don't. Basic retirement planning is part of financial stewardship. But listen to what the man in Jesus' story says. What's this man planning for? How far into, the, into his own future does he look when he makes his plans? The only comfort this man plans for is worldly comfort. The only future this man has in view is his earthly future. Eternity is not even a concern for him. So we need to ask, I need to ask, how far into your future are you planning for? I mean, it's great to plan for your retirement here on earth. But if that's the only future that occupies your mind, you need to know what God thinks of you. He thinks you're a fool. Verse 20, God speaks to the man, to the woman, who only prepares for their future on earth. And God says, fool. God says anyone who spends time fretting over their IRA, their 401k, their mutual funds without giving thought to eternal realities like heaven and like hell, they are in for a horrible surprise. They're fools. 
Anyone who thinks his or her future is secure because their portfolio is performing well. Again, faces a horrible future. They'll be surprised. But you know what? They shouldn't be surprised. God says, fool, this night your soul is required of you. In other words, tonight you are going to die. And the things you have prepared, the things you've prepared for yourself, whose will they be then? Then in verse 21, Jesus reminds all of us, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You see why Jesus warns us to take care and to be on guard against all covetousness? You see why Jesus reminds us that one's life does not consist in the abundance of of his possessions? The question we're dealing with today could not be more important, and the stakes could not be higher than they are. Are you a material woman? Are you a material man? Do you live only for the things of earth? I'm not talking about what you're thinking in your head. We all know the right answers. I'm talking about how we live. Do we live like material people? Do you live a life that really does, in your mind, in your actions, consist of the abundance of your possessions? Be honest with yourself. Do you lack appreciation towards God as your provider? Do you hoard for yourself and lack generosity for others? Are you so tied into your possessions that you're literally afraid to give because you fear you won't have enough for yourself. Is your earthly future the only future you see? Do you lack eternal perspective? Have you really prepared yourself to stand before God on the last day? If you're a material man, if you are a material woman, Jesus wants you to know something. You are going to die. You're going to die. More than that, that could happen at any moment. Any moment. When you go, Jesus is telling us, you're not taking your stuff with you. So Jesus says, are you ready? Are you ready to die? He's asking, are you rich towards God? Because if all you've done is laid up treasure for yourself on earth, God says, you're a fool. And he calls you a fool because no matter how comfortable you may be at this moment in this world, your eternal destiny is miserable agonizing separation from God in hell. Now I need to tell you the good news. It doesn't have to be that way. It's not too late for you to become rich toward God. And here's why it's not too late. 2,000 years ago, God became man in Jesus Christ. And as a man, Jesus lived the perfect sinless life you don't live. Then having no sin of his own, Jesus died on a cross to pay the full penalty for all your sin and for all my sin. More than that, he rose from the grave. He conquered death and he lives today to be Savior and Lord to anyone who will trust him. And by the way, he also lives today to be judge over anyone who won't. 
And that's what the Bible means when it says, for our sake, for your sake, for my sake. He, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him, through faith in him, we might become the righteousness of God. We might be saved. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. The Bible says you can become rich toward God. You can become rich toward God through faith in Jesus who died on a cross for you. Will you confess your sin? Will you repent and will you follow Jesus as Lord? As Lord. Will you believe in what he did for you as Savior when he died on the cross and rose from the grave? Will you make Jesus, will you make Jesus your treasure in this world? Will you make him your treasure for the world to come? Will you find true wealth in Christ that no one can ever, ever take away from you? Follow Jesus, and he'll teach you to trust God. He'll teach you to thank God as your provider. Follow Jesus, and he will teach you how to be generous like he is generous. Follow Jesus, and he will open your eyes to an eternal wealth that you cannot even imagine. And these are the only riches worth living for.